questions, what you thought. We all want to hear all about that. So we'll kick off the second session of the morning. Please give a very warm round of applause for James McHugh, Jan Vidamaran Nandan, and Nidhi Gurugar. Well, a few academy bo academic books have managed to regale me as much as uh, Sandalwood and Carry On. And um, in, in, in about a dozen discrete chapters, uh, James has uh, drawn upon texts such as Mahabharat, Ramayan, and um, other ancient texts such as Bratha Samhita and a lot of Jain and Buddhist texts. Uh, so, and it, 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 it's barely didactic. It is uh, rich in stories and anecdotes, such as that of the idealized city of Kalyana, and then uh, the, uh, the origin of aromatics and the economy around it. Uh, so, this is this is not the sort of a book that you'll sort of skim through. It begs you to stop and smell the roses as you go along. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's pass on the morning to James who will be talking about the book for a while, and then we'll have a quick Q&A uh, amongst us, and then we can pass on the morning to the audience. So ladies and gentlemen, James McHugh. Okay, can you hear me okay? Well, first of all, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, thank you, uh, Nidhi and John V, for coming, and thanks to the audience. And uh, very much a uh, big thank you to the festival, and especially William for inviting me here. And a big thank you to the volunteers, in fact, who have done the most amazing job and hard work with a lot of grouchy people <laughs> getting irate, so volunteers. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, uh, this book, uh, sort of cultural history of smell and perfumery and stinks in, um, in um, sort of early India, sort of uh, up to about 12, 1300, I'd say. Um, it's hard to kind of get a good cut-off date. Um, so I'll, st I'll start talking about how I got into this um, slightly um, um, unmanageable project. Uh, the history of a sense is um, I, I, I was uh, grad school and I was writing a paper on um, on Buddhist monastic regulations, the Vinaya. And uh, if anyone's ever looked at that, there's there's a lot in there on you know what you can and can't wear. You can't have garlands and you can't have this kind of toothpick and all sorts of complicated things. And I was looking at that and I realized it was hard to make much sense of that. Because some of, the, I mean, a lot of the things the, the, the Buddhist monks and nuns um, weren't allowed to do, it wouldn't really bother me if I wasn't allowed to wear garlands, for example. So I was like, obviously this is a rejection or um, a sort of inversion of some sorts of uh, uh, sort of practices that I don't do, that were quite alien to me. And so to understand, in a way, the, um, the, the prohibitions, you had to understand what people were doing. So that, I started dabbling in that. And then it, when I started reading about perfumes, and well, one, I discovered there was an awful lot of text about them as not just literature, but recipes and things. And when I started looking them up and trying to translate some of the vocabulary, almost in all the Sanskrit, actually all the Sanskrit dictionaries typically would just say, you know, whatever Sanskrit word for a fragrant substance, they would just go, a type of perfume. And that was it. And that was the end of the story. So you've got to imagine if somebody in a few thousand years' time was looking at, say, I don't know, American literature, and everything was just a type of car. So it was Rolls Royce, a type of car. Like a Toyota, a type of car. Everything's a type of car. You're missing a lot. So I realized I had to, like, really kind of go back to first principles and do a lot of philological work to kind of you know, reconstruct what was going on and what was, what was posh, what was common, um, what these, you know, things meant, these different aromatics and different combinations of aromatics and smells. So, so where, you know, where do you begin with something like that? So the first thing I looked at was um, how smell worked. You know, how did people think smell worked? Um, they, people did um, have smell as a discrete sense. Um, which, you know, not all cultures might sort of break down the balance of the senses in the same way, but in ancient India, Buddhists, Jains, and Hindus, they all had, you know, there's a sense of smell. And how did smell work? Well, certainly for most of the Hindu philosophies, um, smell is the quality associated with the element earth, the earth element, which has some various interesting things going on there. So the earth element, anything with, made of the earth element also has other all the other sense qualities. 
is the most sort of rich in sense qualities. So an, an earthy thing, think of a lump of damp clay. It has a smell, it has a taste. You can see it, you can feel it. You know, it's multi-sensory. Um, so perfumed, smelly things are multi-sensory by definition in this philosophical theory. And how does smell work? Well, what happens is it's actually quite sophisticated, and they sort of deduced that um, smell what consists of particles um, that leave the smelly object, like say a jasmine flower, and the wind carries them. One of the words for wind in Sanskrit is sort of the thing that carries smell, odor. And the particles get blown to your nose, and there they enter and touch your nose, these bits of the stuff, and you smell it. So also you get this strange thing going on with smell in, uh, in, in sort of classical Indian thought, where it's both a contact sense, it's like you're touching the thing, you actually are touching bits of the stuff, but from afar, like vision. So it's both tactile and contact. So you can be kind of polluted by smells, and it's quite intimate in a way, but it's also, you can do it from afar. So at this point, in fact, have we got earth ready? Yeah. We have. So at this point, we're gonna circulate some smell of earth, because there is this very, very deep connection between odor and earth in India. And, um, and actually, what I'm gonna circulate here is, uh, is not a, an ancient Indian type of fragrance. This is um, a thing, oh, it's going around now. This is um, uh, an itur, um, uh, a more recent technology of distillation. And, and the way they make this, it's the most fabulous perfume, really. It's natural, completely natural. Is They make little, um, this is from Kanoj. I bought it in j -Pos. It's a good um, shop for these things. Um, they make little kind of clay bowls out of sort of smelly clay that's probably got a lot of bacteria in it because that makes the earth smell um, from, say, the bottom of a well. They make these lightly fired bowls and then steam distill them and circulate the steam in a sort of neutral oil or sandalwood oil sometimes. And uh, so that's what you're getting there. And it's meant to be the smell of the earth after the first rains. It's a very cooling fragrance. So that's earth, the smell of earth. And then also, how do people classify smells? And this is where the title of the book came from, is in these, um, these philosophical accounts of the senses, they would often talk about you know, the different colors, the different tastes. And you know, we've, you, many of you have run into that, I'm sure. The different types of smell, smell was almost universally, there's some early complex. Uh, there's one in the Mahabharata that's more complicated, but typically after a certain date, um, there's two types of smell, good smell and bad smell. It's very kind of binary, like, like um, sort of ethical as well, and it's good and evil, there's like good smell, bad smell. And whenever the commentators give an example of like, well, what do you mean by good smell? This, the commonest thing for the good smell, the archetypal good smell is sandalwood, and the archetypal sort of bad um, smell is rotten meat or corpse or, or sort of um, carrion. So that's where the title of the book comes from. So that's the kind of abstract understanding of smell. Uh, another thing I wanted to do is like, you know, what smells did people notice? Um, because even if we kind of work out, you know, what smells were in the environment and what perfumes people used, you've got to bear in mind things smell different in those days, not just because there was different stuff to smell, but because things smell different because of what's in your head when you smell them. So take the example, um, in America, people, in you know, the USA, people use a lot of wintergreen, this kind of, um, it's a herb, this, you know, it's a, I can't remember what the molecule is, but wintergreen. They have chewing gum, wintergreen chewing gum, and British people think it's just disgusting. And I don't know what, I don't know what the Indian take on wintergreen is, but to British people, wintergreen smells like the most disgusting ointment, and it's horrible. But Americans will happily sort of eat wind, wintergreen candy and things like that. And yet again, you know, that's in the head, how, how you react to it. So I wanted to sort of reconst you know, get a bit of a sense of uh, how, you know, from very elite Sanskrit texts, you know, your, your materials are pretty limited. But I wanted to get a bit of a sense of that. And, one thing I was particularly keen to do was, um, you, know, you know when you have like a wine taster and they kind of go, oh, it's got, you know, Belgian chocolate and hazelnuts and, I don't know, brown sugar and things like that. But they assume that the person reading the wine review knows that, unless it's a really pretentious wine writer. And, and then it's, then it's um, notable that they're trying to sort of alienate you by, like, you know, mentioning smells that they know you won't know. So... But anyhow, so what would an in ancient Indian wine writer or coffee writer or tea writer, you know, what would, their, what would their benchmark smells be? And there's all sorts of descriptions of smells like this. Um, there's, you know, um, there's diagnosis of disease in an Ayurvedic text who smell. There's the um, um, 
evaluation of sandalwood in the Artishastra, sort of by smell. There's lots of texts on this. And um, so it turns out it was really, really interesting that, you know, the common earth was a really common smell, sort of standard smell. Uh, lotus was very important. Sandalwood, very important. Fish. A lot of cow things, cow urine, just cow. And uh, lots of flowers, lots of types of jasmines, especially a lot of types of jasmines. So that was the kind of palette of sort of standard odors. You know, sort of building a bit of a picture of what, what smells stand out in people's environments, how they think it works. And then another thing I needed to look at was, like, you know, what do smells make people do? Before, this is all before I looked at the perfumes, you know, because you've got to work out, you know, what people's aesthetics are and their sort of general take on the sense. So what do smells make people do? And, well, typically nowadays, anywhere in the world, in fact, when I mention sort of work on smell or perfume, people mention memory. I'm sure this is something that people go, oh, smells evoke memories. It's the kind of Proustian thing, the kind of Madeleine. And actually, there's absolutely no references to the smell memory thing in, in, in sort of classical ancient India or medieval India. It's just not there. Sometimes will people will talk about memory and they'll go, oh, I, I think of, you know, there's this the Chauda Panchashika, there's a lot of remembering in that, but it's not just all about smell. It's about, you know, tastes and images and things like that. There isn't that kind of correlation between smell and memory at all. That's actually a bit of an 18th century European thing, which doesn't mean it's not actually happening. It just means people weren't very interested in that. Just like people in ancient India, they're really, 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 really caught. You know when you get a little sort of twitchy thing in your eye, that, that kind of thing? But in ancient India, people are obsessed with that. They, they, they write about that a lot. They're very conscious of that and talk about it and have words for it in a way that I, I'm not very good at talking about it. So anyhow, so, you know, what, what, you know, what were the... Um, what's, you know, what were the smells that people noticed? Uh, and... Um, so it wasn't memory, so what does it do in literature? What does smell do in literature? Well, as, you, as I mentioned, wind carries smells, and it carries it across space, kind of big distances. And it's, yet it's a very kind of intimate, it's part of the, the person or thing that you're kind of encountering. And so what smells tend to do is they connect people, they attract or repel in space. So memory is all about time, it's all internal to me, like I'm remembering my previous... I don't know, my Parisian moment in my childhood or something like that. Whereas the, the sort of Indic smell literature is smells make people travel and go to things or flee from things. Some famous examples, so in the Mahabharata, um, you have this uh, unfortunate lady um, who's born with a very strong fish smell, Matsya Gandhi. She saw, it's a very long, complicated story. I'm not going to get into the full details, but she sorts that out. She manages to sort of get a good smell, a really amazing smell, in fact. Uh, you know, travels far and wide, abnormally beautiful smell from her body that sort of permeates space. And this, in track, she's Satyavati then, that, this in, she, through this she attracts um, Shantanu, uh, an important character in Mahabharata, and they get together, and he finds her through her smell, that's what brings them together. Um, Krishna, when he was a child, um, is sort of suckled by um, this demoness, Putika, um, who's sort of trying to sort of poison him. Um, but his sort of such are Krishna's powers that um, you know she sort of dies. And when they cremate her body, um, it smells of agar wood, which I, we can talk about afterwards. Perhaps it's a bit of a agar woods uh, what agar bati used to have in them, not so much anymore. But anyhow, the, you know a very very valued incense. So she smells of agar wood, and this is in the Bhagavata Purana, and this attracts everyone's like, wow, what's an amazing smell? So they all go. A lot of people go, and they, they see Krishna. They're attracted by the smell. You also get things that deter people, well, more demons. So in, in various medical texts and sort of tantric exorcism texts um, and, and things like childhood diseases, you will have these sort of stinky incenses with sort of things like vulture toenails and dung that you burn to kind of drive things away. Another thing that smells do is they just make people happy. They make people happy and it can also be very arousing. Um, so that's what smells make people do. Given these powers of smell, obviously, makes sense to manipulate them. So that's where you get into perfumes and perfumery. And then per, the, the whole, well, one, it, there was nothing, perfumes and, actually the word perfume is very gendered in, in the English language. In, in, in America, 
you know, men wear cologne and like women wear perfume or fragrance. It's very gen much less gendered um, in, in, in this period. It's very, I mean, obviously it's a class thing because this stuff was often quite valuable, but the gender division is, uh, is not so present. And what's interesting with the perfumes is what we do tend to do now is we kind of distill or manufacture artificial things that are very concentrated. We mix them all together to make it like nice, harmonious thing. You spray it on. It's invisible. You know, everything's there, a little patch on your neck or a little patch on your wrist. That's it. The way it works in um, the period I'm looking at, um, and you still get this in, in some, contact, some context in India, is um, that you would have lots of different types of, different sort of genres of perfume on your body. So you would have like a garland, and you might, your body might be smeared with a paste, uh, a sort of vilepana, which might be like sandalwood and camphor and saffron. You might have um, uh, perfumed your clothes with incense or your hair with incense. You would have a mouth perfume. You might have hair oil as well, and you'd probably be sort of scrubbed with a perfumed exfoliant paste. And this was sort of assembled on your whole body, so you would smell of jasmine and agar wood smoke and sort of camphoraceous mouth perfume and sandalwood on your body. And it would all be assembled, sort of spread over your body. And not only that, but the substances used there, they're not sort of distilled and concentrated and re-diluted with alcohol. They're kind of at natural strength. And you had to assemble this in a body, and you had to do this in a harmonious way. Um, there's this fabulous little incident in um, a, a wonderful text, one of my favorite in Sanskrit, the Brihat Katha Shloka Samgraha uh, by Buddha Swamin. And uh, there's a moment there, it's a fabulous little incident, but basically what happens is someone's testing someone's perfume canniness and he deliberately burns a bad incense for a garland in a particular context. Uh, and and the, the person who's being tested on his sort of tastefulness with regard to perfume, imagine some sort of pretentious wine cheese pairing or something. And the guy who's being tested kind of goes, ah, you give me a migraine. It's like, I can't handle that, and sort of dashes out of the room. And then they say, ah, you, you know your perfumes, because you could tell that that incense and that garland were like off, and they just could not go together. So this kind of gestalt of scent on your body had to um, work together. Uh, so very, very different today. And, you know, quite a lot of work as well to put all this stuff on and have people make it fresh every morning and things like that. So that's one thing that's different about the perfumes. Uh, another thing is, like I said, uh, you know, like anything that has an odor is going to be, by definition, multisensory in, in, in their understanding. And that's kind of how it plays out, really. Um, so the perfumes, like I said, they were visible. You know, you, you probably see, you know, if you have sandalwood paste with saffron in and it's on my arm, you can see it. You can see a garland, different colored gardens, things like that. You can see smoke as well. You know, there's descriptions of like beautiful agar wood smoke. I think it's in the, um, in, uh, anyhow, Kalidasa has um, descriptions of agar wood smoke sort of billowing out of palace windows and things like that. And so you could, it was visible, it was visible, and therefore could be experienced from really far away. And it was also tactile, so it might be heating and cooling. And actually, they really talked about this a lot. I'm not just sort of making this up. They really talk a lot about musk being black. All sorts of poems, it's in the Gita Govinda, where they kind of make an ink out of, out of a black musk and say they'll paint like a deer on a woman's face, which is, you know, the moon has a deer on it, or... And so it's like, your face is like the moon, I painted some you know, black musk on your face. And so, you know, there's the colored aspect of it, and then there's the temperature aspect. So, say, musk, agar wood, and saffron are very heating. And actually, perfumers uh, and, uh, still believe this today. They're very funny about what they'll put on you in a kind of cold season now. Camphor and sandalwood are cooling. Say, so camphor is white, musk is black. And actually, there's a very famous uh, thing of this that people don't often realize is camphor is uh, the, the Hindu god Venkateshvara um, has um, this very distinctive appearance with this kind of like large sort of trapezoid of, of whiteness on his face. And that is a huge piece of Borneol camphor, um, which is the sort of high, the sort of classy camphor um, that they put on every once a week, they mold on. And it's in the middle of it, there's a streak of musk. And you can see that, you know, you can see that in images, you can see that from way off in the temple, you might never smell it. And it's, that's a really good example of how strikingly visible um, these fragrances were. Uh, and so they were multi-sensory, and we, ours aren't anymore. I mean, the bottle might be pretty, the advertising might be pretty, but the actual perfume's invisible. Not, none of you can tell if I smell what I smell like from, from where you're sitting. If I was wearing ancient Indian perfumes, you'd know. 
Well, you'd be able to imagine, or you wouldn't if you were so poor that you'd never smelt them. You might just go, well, I don't know what that smells like, but I've seen it. So that's one thing. Um, another one, another sort of visible thing you had was the, the flowers. Very important, the flowers. Yet again, they weren't, sometimes people disagree with this. I don't, the perfume text, they weren't distilling at that point. And the flowers were experienced in the form of garlands. So, you know, temples would have, um, you know, temple gardens, like gar gardens and things like that, which some of them still do. And it's, garlands are yet again an interesting thing because they're very ephemeral, an individual garland just last a day or half a day in the hot weather. They're seasonal often as well, so you know you can only wear certain flowers at certain seasons because they don't necessarily all flower all year round. They're not concentrated, they're not distilled, and the economics of that is very different to what you have when you're, um, uh, you know, you, if you take something like jasmine and you distill a load of it and put it in a tiny bottle, you can, you can smell that jasmine all year round, you can take it to somewhere freezing cold where you never get jasmine growing naturally. And, but when you're dealing with flowers, it's local, it's seasonal, so it's temporally and, uh, and spatially very limited. So that's what the perfumes were like. So quite different from ours these days. Um, and how did this change over time, though? Because you know, so far I've not talked much about history. Um, well, they, what happened over time is there was always quite a lot of local fragrance substances, something like vetiver is kind of local. The local thing, it's a bit like herbs and spices in Europe, the local things like vetiver, they were used a lot, but they weren't celebrated. So when you get literary descriptions of, I don't know, some queen kind of putting her you know, fragrances on, they won't necessarily rave about the amount of vetiver she's using. It's not very prestigious. The prestigious perfumes in any given period tended to be more like spices in Europe, so therefore perceived of as exotic. And like the texts in India talk about them as if they're coming from far old places, which they often were. Um, sandalwood coming from the south, but quite you know, difficult to get to areas. Um, saffron in Kashmir, obviously, you know, in Kashmir local, elsewhere remote, but you know, some of it was coming from far away, like Southeast Asia. And, and what counted as far away or far away, but close enough to be getting in, into sort of the culture, changed over time. So you have this development of the palette of aromatics, um, where they, they the, so in say Vedic texts, you have flowers, you have, um, let's see, you have this stuff, costus root. Uh, I'll hand this round, this is a lump of costus root. There, cut in a So that's costus root, you have costus root. And actually, Costa's root is a really interesting one. It's really, really, really prestigious. In, in the Atava Veda, there's things about Costa's root, and it's deified. Um, it's the, sometimes called the brother of Soma. It, they talk about how it's imported and traded, and people sort of haggle over the best varieties. And, um, and if, that never, if that just ends up vanishing, that's cool. I don't need it back. And um, yeah, so Costas Root, and it's got it's got it's really nice sort of rooty, earthy perfume, Costas Root. Um, the Romans were getting Costas Root as well. You get it in things like Tibetan incense now. And, uh, and then another one that's very mentioned in Vedic things is Gugulu. And uh, Gugulu is quite familiar to people today and still used in religious contexts as an incense in a way that is perhaps the most enduring Indian fragrant substance. It goes way, way, way back as an incense used in religious contexts and probably secular ones in early times as well. So that's the kind of early period, the, the sort of... Um, and also there's another thing that's kind of of that nature. This is Jatamansi, another one of these kind of like Hindu Kush, Himalayan roots. They're not from that far afield, to be honest. They're kind of like very much from sort of South Asia, really. Um, by the epic period, the prominent, they, they, they're not so prominent, they're around, but by the epic period, the promi prominent things are sandalwood and agar wood, um, these valuable woods. They loom large in the epics. And then there's a huge sea change, in fact, around the Gupta period, where musk, camphor, and things like saffron they appear, and then like from then on, there's a kind of a bit of a stability in the kind of canon of um, great fragrance, which would typically be um, sandalwood, agar wood, musk, camphor, saffron. They're the kind of great perfumes, and then at a later period again, um, civet, roses, and ambergris appear, 
And yet again, they're kind of new and they're exotic and they're highly valued. And at this point, I want to hand around the uh, Hina Ita, because this, is a, this is, illustrates two things. So this is another one of these uh, distilled things. It illustrates two things. One, it kind of contains like a kind of weird scent palimpsest, this whole thing. It has these, it'll have costas root in, it'll have jetamancy in, um, it'll have things like sandalwood in, and it will probably have like roses in as well, because the, they do a sort of layered distillation. So this kind of like has all these things in it, sort of building up over time. And it also does that thing. It has, they distill flowers into Hina. It's atar Hina, it's very warming in winter. They distill flowers into it, and they also have all these roots. So it kind of combines in one little thing the garland and the paste and the incense in one thing. So that's an interesting, you know, it kind of proves two points. Um, that it's, it's strange stuff. If, if there's enough on the stick, maybe rub it on your hand and see how it goes. I like it, but it's a bit of an acquired taste. So that's, he, that's an iter heater. That's, like I said, that's a more recent development, but illustrates some of these points. And, and, and there is a continuity till the present day, um, like Googaloo, for example. Um, and then finally, um, I'll talk a bit about the texts where these perfumes are mentioned. I've mentioned the philosophical things and the literary things, but there's also texts simply just about perfumery. And some of them are quite plain and simple, but some of them are very complex and playful and poetic and really ingenious. Um, actually, it's worth mentioning here the, um, the scholar who discovered these two of these important perfumery texts, the Gandhasara and the Gandhavada, the earliest stuff in the Brahat Samitovara Hamihira, um, is this wonderful scholar some of you might have run into, P.K. Gode, who was at Pune in the Bandaka uh, library there. And his work on Indian cultural history is, um, is, the, is the big inspiration for mine. Um, I owe him a lot. And also a scholar who used to be at Aligarh University, S.R. Sharma. Uh, does history of science. So, um, you know, a lot of this is really coming from previous Indian scholarship who sort of paved the way. But yeah, so these texts are really clever. And two things that are really worth mentioning is the names of perfumes. So if you think like nowadays, you know, nowadays ne perfumes have like kind of weird tacky names like obsession or evocative names, things like that. And you tend to think, oh, well, that must be some marketing ploy, you know what I mean? Like, they didn't used to have names, but it turns out these texts, um, probably 13th, 14th century, it's really hard to know, in fact, with these ones, they mention perfume names, uh, and they're kind of quite crazy. Um, there's, there's ones, some of, a lot of them are kind of erotic, so they're kind of things like arouser of karma deva, or sort of inflamer of karma deva. Um, or sometimes they're called after varieties of arrow, like really vicious types of arrow, because Karmadeva has a you know, bow and arrow, so it's like it's an arrow, this perfume. Uh, there's a beautiful one called Moon Juice, uh, which is kind of obviously cooling, or Southern Wind, which will be cooling as well. Uh, there's one called Shame of a Respectable Woman. Um, there's also, there's this fabulous one. There's this one, it, just, it describes all these ingredients and it's called Koga Chati. So, you know, who's going or, you know, who's he? Who, who goes there? Which man goes there? Which person goes there? You know, who's he? Let's say he's here, sort of a, a loose but kind of a more accessible translation. And the, the, uh, the, the recipe kind of reads, you know, I use agar wood, gugaloo, this, that, the other, ghee or whatever, and uh, mix them all together. And then you get the incense called, who's he? Which is called Who's He? Because whenever you perfume your clothes with this and walk down the street, everyone will say, Who's He? It's like, and this is like, I just think this is amazing. It's just so kind of modern and like, you know. And then, um, and then finally, there's this other one. It's kind of hard to explain. There's this one verse. It's like crazy. It's like a kind of cryptic crossword. So it's just, it looks like a really, really sort of like, sort of po-faced, um, sort of moralistic verse, but it's in the middle of all these weird novelty recipes, a bit like, who's he? And it looks like, you know, it just looks like a load of disapproving statements. Um, so like, you know, um, one of them, this, the first one, for example, is kind of like, you know, too much ornament is the shame of a respectable woman. And, and, and then it kind of lists all these things and says, oh, this is chaos, sort of, kolahala. This is kind of like, oh, madness, sort of naughtiness sort of over-the-top, sort of frenzy, or something like that, it lists them. But then there's this Marathi commentary in another text sort of breaks it down, and it's completely the maddest thing. So say the, say the you know, decoration is the shame of a respectable woman, well, that splits into two. So we have the shame of a respectable woman, and the Marathi commentary explains that that would be 
fingernails, because if you've ever read the Kama Sutra, people, you know, there's the whole scratching thing, and, and if you read quite a lot of the more sort of erotic literary text, there is, the, like, in, you get this in the Gita Govinda with the whole sort of fingernails being a bit incriminating, the sort of scratch marks. So, you know, like, shame of respect for a woman is fingernails, and then, well, what's fingernails? Well, the, name, the word for fingernails is nukka, um, also refers to a rather peculiar perfume made from the operculum of a kind of um, a shank, a kind of a conch shell, which they use in incenses quite a lot. And, and all the parts, and, and then, so what you do with this thing is you take this moral verse, you chop it up, you work out what the bits are, and then each one of those words has a double meaning, and then you take it away and you make it, and you've got this kind of crazy cryptic crossword puzzle. Um, of an incense recipe. So, I mean, it's really clever stuff and actually very difficult um, to sort of translate. I mean, you can imagine it's kind of almost impossible to translate that kind of stuff. So, yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much done here. Um, we'll kind of go and, and talk about all this now. But, yeah, I mean, um, I guess to sort of sum up, there is all this amazing sophisticated history of Indian perfumery. And like I said, I just went to a shop, uh, the Imliwala shop. It's very good in and Juhari Bazaar, and like they sell all these things. You can buy all these things. You can, and actually, I mean, one pla the place where you can really see the process of making these things really well is um, on a huge scale, is, the, is the, in Tirupati, at the back of the temple there. They have these great big sandalwood grindstones, like oil drums, and these great big logs of sandalwood, and they make camphor and saffron. And that's kind of probably what you would have had on a, on a sort of regal scale back in the day. Um, but, but it's still going on, this, as well as the itters, which are a bit later. Um, but this other stuff, you know, is still there. But it's wonderful stuff. If you ever wear it, it's amazing. I mean, people do a bit, but I feel like, uh, you know, it seems a pity people don't wear it more. So, um, yes, let's kind of continue the conversation over here. Oh, and this is some borneo old camphor. Sorry, this is what, uh, um, this is, there's lots of types of camphor. It's complicated. Um, this appeared quite early, around the 3rd, 4th century. This is what Venkateshwara has on his head. And when it appeared, it, it was so valuable because um, it was coming from, say, Sumatra, and you have to chop down these huge camphor trees inside that have a few cavities in which this would crystallize naturally. Then you've got to bring it from Sumatra to India and sort of bring it across India. It was so valuable. Um, and so it was, you know, that's why the camphor flame in a temple was like such a lavish thing, but camphor got, actually camphor got really, you know why camphor got really cheap is because they discovered that it was essential to making celluloid. Um, for the plastics industry, so they had to kind of get a good synthetic camphor, and that made camphor dirt cheap when they synthesized it, which has kind of messed with the ecology of Hindu temples, a lot of which have banned camphor because it's just too much. So it's kind of, it's, um, it's movies and photography, in a way, that have sort of meddled with the ecology of camphor in Hindu temples. So that, that's some borneo camphor. You're probably familiar with that. That's the one that's vaguely edible, but don't eat too much. Like, it, it causes, like, kidney damage or something, but anyhow. Thank you, James. That was indeed a very enlightening session. So um, we've spoken so much about the Eastern theory of smell. Uh, and as we know, it's not only just aesthetics, but it also draws upon medicine, wealth, statecraft, and so much more. How different is it from the Western theory of smell is what um, I wanted to ask. And what do you also think about this, Janmi? I mean, you've traveled the world with your perfumes. How different is it? Um, you know, um, what is the approach to perfumes in the West? So let's begin with James, and then we can... Yeah. Okay, this, is this working? Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, um, well, I mean, I think there's, there's that thing that, like, it's a bit like with gemstones as well, in fact, that um, within South Asia, people had access to a lot more of these things. Uh, they were commoner, there were more types of stuff available. They, get, they had a lot of these things in Europe, but they were a lot more sort of arcane and from far away than they were um, within India. And I think there's the sort of, that di one of the differences is this enduring, um, for the very, very wealthy people really, but this practice of like really vast coverage with these visible pastes and things. Um, which, may, I mean, I don't, I don't know kind of where that came, but I mean, it could connect with, obviously, if you're kind of like in a cold climate and you're kind of wrapped up, you know, there's, there's only so much you can put on your skin in a way. I don't know. Um, the kind of display of these things um, on the skin. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the main, the, the, the big difference is the, uh, the enormous accessibility of so many different types of aromatic. 
and a huge knowledge, because that's the thing. They were, like with gemstones as well, they, they might not necessarily come from India, but they, they, they would, like even today, they were traded through India. So, you know, they might be kind of coming from Borneo or Sumatra or something like that, but then they were being processed and sort of sent elsewhere. So there was, you know, there was this kind of entrepot sort of um, knowledge as well that you get in. There's a lot of text on the evaluation of aromatics, just as there are with gemstones on how to tell good musk from bad musk. Uh, and in different values of these things. So, um, yeah. Um, James, firstly, thanks a lot for that enlightening talk. Um, um, as a, um, what's called a practicing perfumer, as in my work is essentially about the, you know, the crafts of the mechanics of smell, I create fragrances, um, and I've created fragrances um, for uh, around the world, uh, for Americans, for Brazilians, for Japanese, of course, for Indians, for English, for Europeans. And I think the function of smell today is, um, uh, around the world is, is, um, is very, very different depending on the geographies. So one of the things that has always shocked me is the amount of advertising of fragrances which is around the emotion of love and just a lot of fragrances today are about love. Um, but in reality, and especially when I read your book, I, 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 I was very you know, um, surprised and very happy to discover actually that the role of smell was as much medicinal as well as um, political and so on and so forth. But today, a lot of fragrances are essentially about love. But I think, for me, the biggest departure um, creating smells around the world is certain ingredients being perceived as being more masculine and certain others being more feminine. So for example, India is amazing. India is amazing because it's one of the, it is probably the only country in the world where men actually consume more perfumes than women. And it's the anomaly, anomaly in the world. You never see that anywhere else. Um, but in terms of um, ingredients, um, lavender, for example, which is traditionally considered masculine, um, the Brazilians, Brazilian women wear lavender, but English men prefer lavender, the Japanese women like lavender, and Indian women like lavender. So India is also interesting because there is no demarcation between masculine or feminine perfumes even today. In modern perfumery, we see actually in India a lot of men wearing Chanel number no. 5 because they just like the jasmine note in it. Um, and a lot of women um, have told me that their first fragrance has been uh, Kenzo Om, which is an extremely peppery, spicy, masculine fragrance. So I think the, 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 the big difference for me between India and, let's say, the Western world is, is this notion of men's fragrances and women's fragrances, which is non-existent here, which is very, very clear. In Europe, even today, people ask me, oh, when they smell something, is this for men or is this for women? But in India, that never happens. So, um, well, um, I'd, I'd like to inform you that Janvi is uh, perhaps uh, India's only perfumer. Um, and uh, she is based in Paris, and uh, she does travel to India and uh, retails her perfumes here as well. So I, w I wanted to ask you, uh, when I was writing about Itarwalas in my book, yeah. The Lost Generation, uh, I came across this um, a gentleman who, who was okay with his wife and his uh, daughter making the perfume um, uh, in their workshop shops, but he was not okay with selling them in the stores because his, um, w uh, what he thought of it was that women, uh, he was a Muslim uh, entrepreneur, and what he thought of it was that women uh, are, it's, it's okay for women to work behind the doors, they cannot be displayed as wares in the shop. So do you face any discrimination um, as a woman perfumer? Um. First, thanks for, thanks for the introduction. Um, I, I, I am the country's only fine fragrance perfumer, which is you know, what, what, what happens in perfumery today, and then I'll get back to your question directly, is that um, earlier on, like in your book, we speak about perfumers who blend everything from medicinal oils to pastes used for deodorizing the body to um, um, hair um, uh, cleaners and to perfumes. Today, we are all very specialized. For example, as a fine fragrance perfumer, um, I work with fragrances that are meant to please, that are worn on the skin, but my colleagues um, work only with soaps, and then I would have some colleagues who are very specialized only in, in fragrancing detergents, which 
which is by far the most complicated of perfumery and so on. Um, and there are other perfumers in the country who are actually very specialized in soaps because Indian soap fragrances are still considered one of the finest in the world and, and, and you know, it's the world's largest consumer of soaps. But um, going back directly to your, your question, which I think is more of you know, a, a larger social problem than, than related to perfumes, but women in perfumery have come a long, long way. Yes, I'm the country's only perfumer and the country's only um, female perfumer working at a global scale. Um, but even globally, I mean, we're, we're, we're probably just 10% of the entire you know, perfumery population. And we're only 5,000 people globally who work in, in, in this field of smells. But there is one last bastion where there is no woman at all, actually two. One is in the trading of ingredients. It's, for example, the buying and selling of jasmine, which is like the stock market, which happens every morning from 2.30 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. And I attend these things from time to time. There are no women in that. And the last thing is, is actually is a bit the, um, is, um, is, is the invention of new smells. Because a lot of work today as a contemporary perfumer um, is creating new smells, smells that we have never smelled before. So, for example, um, a fragrance, a very popular fragrance called Isemiake has, has the smell of, of, of seawater in it, which is a new invention which was, which was done in the late 1960s. So, you know, that last bit of, of creating new molecules is a very, very... Uh, you know, it's, it's a very closed um, group to women. Still, for, I, I don't quite understand why. It's perhaps there are not so many um, female chemists or something like that. But I, don't, I don't really know. But yes, but, but things are improving, and it's actually quite fun to be a girl perfumer. Uh, that's for you, James. Um, uh, in, in your book, you, you state this that in Nyai Manjari, which is a 9th century poet, Jayanta's. Um, work. He claims that there is a penance for smelling impure substances, which itself is an act of sin. And even in Manu's law code, um, you know, he says that making a Brahmin cry, smelling liquor or substances that should not be smelt, cheating and sex with man, these traditions call, call these sins that cause exclusion from the caste. So um, what are these smells which are so base that, that can cause an exclusion from the caste? And um, could you dwell upon this, like the association of smells with caste in ancient and even probably current India? Right, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, um, that, these are, that's a sort of list of sins. It's very much sort of aimed at sort of a Brahmin male, that, in, uh, in, in Manu. And that's a list of sort of secondary sins, the kind of, say, the, the, the um, you know, the, 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 the sort of, Primary sin would be like killing a Brahmin and then making a Brahmin cry is the sort of secondary one. So the primary sin there is drinking liquor or sura, and uh, and then the secondary sin is is smelling liquor or things that shouldn't be smelled. And the commentaries uh, tend to expand that into um, liquor, which uh, there's, there's, there's quite a lot on that, in fact. And it's sort of socially, it's hard to get your head around. I, I guess it's. Um, it might be hard sometimes to avoid it um, um, if, you know, because smells travel. So it kind of, and also they mentioned onions and garlic. So it was basically the stuff that, you know, it's the same stuff that you can't eat or drink. Um, you can't smell it. And I guess it's sort of, um, I guess it's maybe how it functioned. Well, one, like I said, there's a kind of structural parallelism between the primary sins and the sort of secondary ones. Um, so they had to kind of get it in there and smelling. I mean, there's a phrase I've heard quite a lot is a sort of smelling being half of eating. And, and if you buy garlands in a temple and you, and you sniff them before you offer them, you can't give them. It's like taking a bite out of the food or something. It's, it's juta. And uh, so, um, so I think it's mainly that. Uh, but how that played out in practice, I mean, I guess it was like, you know, keep away from that stuff as well. So, um, yeah. Question on uh, terminology of smell. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, in the in the uh, new age, in uh, new age uh, terminology of smell has to do with terms like um, uh, oaky and uh, uh, buttery, and um, uh, you have uh, you know uh, fancier terms, uh, terms which are associated with um, elite elitism and sophistication. Uh, whereas in um, uh, whereas the smells, uh, the notes of smells that you mentioned in your book uh, back then were go urine and there was um, cow dung and uh, there was uh, ghee so um, do you do you think that back then smell wasn't um, uh, uh, so much to do with sophistication as it is now 
Um, I think, well, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, perfumery was about sophistication. Right. Um, but it's true, there is a contrast between the sort of wine writing. That, I mean, there's some fancy coffee shop in Los Angeles, and I remember there was one of the coffees, and it was like, this is like Swiss chocolate. As opposed, it's just like, what's, you know, as opposed to Belgian chocolate. It's like, well, how am I going to know the difference between that? Or really obscure things. And so there's a kind of certain, like, oh, Swiss chocolate uh, um, in there, whereas definitely these uh, very, very highbrow scholarly um, Indian texts, they tend to be things like lotus, fish, you know, cow. And uh, so there is a much more sort of democratic um, sort of smell world they're talking about. And I always think it's interesting because, you know, you, you, tend, you can read these more philosophical texts and they're in Sanskrit and they're ancient and you, you can sort of have this vision of this very sort of serious highbrow person. And clearly that person was at, um, at least um, aware of this, this world of streets and cows and goats and, and rotting fish. And it kind of, it's kind of nice to sort of see that um, sort of humanity in, in these sometimes rather um, very scholarly dry texts. So, yeah. Would, could you dwell on that yeah. as well, Charlie? <clears throat> it's, um, it's very interesting what we've done to perfume vocabulary today. In fact, amongst the perfumers, amongst us, we have a very specific vocabulary. Um, smell doesn't have vocabulary, by the way, but we, we, we give um, certain, for example, we would describe um, an absolute rose as being woody, cheese-like, um, lemony, clove-like, uh, etc. Going to fishy smells, um, in our fragrance uh, perfumer's palette, we don't extract fish but we do have fishy smells. For example, we consider the smell of cardamom slightly fishy. We consider the smell of an extract of algae, obviously um, fishy, and there's a whole bunch of other fishy smells. But it's just that we don't talk about it anymore. We talk about it amongst us, but when we communicate with the public, we've become terrified about talking about um, goat urine or, or you know, cow dung or whatever. We still use a lot of fecal smells in fragrances. No good fragrance today is possible without actually using an animal note. And we just don't talk about it because we're terrified of what, how people are going to react. You know, even a simple thing, I remember I created a top note, which was a cucumber note, which is very rare in modern perfumery. And um, the marketing team wanted to call it apple um, because it just works well with people. They want to hear apple and they don't want to hear cucumber, which is just an ugly thing. Then there's this very amazing fragrance in the 1940s, which was called coriander, and it, the inspiration was coriander, but uh, that fragrance died because it was called coriander. So we, we were unable to call things, who am I, and there she goes, and you know. <laughs> Uh, I think James circulated the Gugulu around. So Gugulu, like he said, was basically uh, the fake sandalwood, which was made, made from neem tree bark. Oh, well, so that's a, there's a, uh, well, there's a whole load of stuff in perfume text on how to make sort of artificial things. So right. you, know, you can buy really cheap sandalwood pellets that are kind of just for rituals, and they might not necessarily have much. So there's a lot of stuff on how to make artificial um, right. sandalwood. That, that's what within, my question yeah. is about. So what, what are these artificial aromatics, and how have they changed over the year from the synthetic perfumes that we have now? Uh, how have these artificial aromatics changed uh, over, the, over the centuries, in fact? Let's put it that well, way. Well, it's true. I mean, I've not looked into the modern ones, but there's... A, there's a lot of these texts do have a whole section on how to um, make, say, f you know, artificial camphor. I, don't, I mean, uh, you know, is it synthetic, artificial, fake? You know, it's hard to know. They don't seem, like, embarrassed about doing this, so I think it really is kind of like the cheap version. I mean, when you buy Googaloo, when I was buying that the other day, there were three types I could buy. There was three qualities, and, you know, so it's still like that. But yeah, there's, a, there's an artificial sandalwood they give where you fill and you kind of cut a neem tree down and hollow it out and fill it with googaloo and build a fire around, cover it in clay and build a fire around it and then you get this sort of artificial sandalwood. So there's obviously a market in, in that uh, at the same time, yeah. Maybe the modern version you could dwell on. Um, the last time we created an all natural fragrance was perhaps in the late 17th century. So uh, I, I, I don't know of a world of natural fragrances, honestly. Um, the first synthetic molecule in, let's say, global perfumery was developed in the late 18th century, and then that created this incredible house of fragrances called Guerlain. Um, I, I can't imagine creating fragrances without power synthetics, and these, these molecules actually cost 
millions and millions and millions of, um, of, of dollars to produce and, 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 and we use them not only because if we would use, let's say, an all natural palette, every fragrance would smell the same because our palette would be limited to around about 300 ingredients. But today we use thousands of different molecules and fragrances. So I think, you know, um, I, I'm not going to details of, but, but invention in smells is what drives modern perfumery. Yeah, actually, that, that's, that's something that, like I was talking about, the sort of development over time of the, the perfumery palette is, this is something that's very distinctive about the Indian perfumery is that if something cool comes along that's new, they just take it in and they, they add it to the mix. That, that's and Indian they're not scared general, of isn't yeah, it? Yeah, they're not scared of artificial... So the, in, like you were saying about the kind of the marketing, the marketing tends to push the natural, oh. and people are very <laughs> pro-natural. Whereas Absolutely. the reality is not. People don't yeah. want to hear that yeah. their fragrance has synthetic stuff in it. Yeah. It does. There isn't a single smell in the world today that is entirely natural. Even when it says natural, it's just not possible. Yeah. It's, it's toxic. I mean, a lot of natural stuff is, causes allergies. So unless you, you, you yeah. produce it in a you know, spef specific way, isolating the allergens, you, you cannot use only natural ingredients. And that, that is totally consistent with the openness to innovation that I saw um, in the recipes. Um, so, you know, artificial is good in the past and today. So people don't like to hear that, though. But, yeah. I'm desperately trying to make synthetic sexy. Oh. I, I, it's, it's, it's just, it's very, very tough. We need a marketing team for that, I think. <laughs> well, so before we call this uh, a wrap, uh, let's have some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, we'll take three. Um, and we'll have all the questions together, then you can answer them perhaps. Um, so uh, what about the ladies sitting behind Willie? Uh, I'm an aromatherapist based in Jaipur and uh, looking at how people are using the synthetic uh, ingredient and whereas uh, you have a lot of uh, natural uh, therapeutic ingredients to the natural oils which are produced. Absolutely, yeah. Don't you think, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of people and uh, they don't, they tell people, okay, we're using natural products, but they, they don't realize what harm they're causing to the user, the end user. Could you just uh, share your views on this? The, the uh, use should of, we take um, all the questions together yeah. and then you can probably, it, it'll be easier. Uh, the gentleman in the turban, please. Sorry, let me take it from you. My question is specifically to you with, res with respect to abstract smell, which you mentioned. It is quite poetic about it. You just try to elucidate that aspect of abstract smell with respect to perfume, which you mentioned. Abstract smell. Right. And uh, the lady in the seventh or eighth row, yeah. Yeah. So this is about the Sanskrit text. Um, you mentioned that there are um, that the different smells are mentioned in Jain and Hindu and Buddhist texts. Is there any difference between um, the texts between the different groups of communities? Uh, yeah, with the first one, I mean, uh, I mean, maybe it's more um, appropriate for Janvi, but um, I mean, obviously, smell, uh, aromatic substances play a huge role in the um, Ayurvedic system, and and uh, and actually, probably you wouldn't use these artificial ones for that, like the artificial sandalwood. It wouldn't have the correct qualities in that time. So certainly, um, I mean, there's very little distinction away between sort of spice, medicine, perfume at that period. And I, I think for medical purposes, you know, you would want um, the real thing at that point. Um, yeah, but... Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm a fine fragrance perfumer, and I know nothing about aromatherapy. It's, it's a lack of knowledge on my side, but it's also the way we're taught to be perfumers today. Our, our role is not to heal the world. And I think that's sad, because um, all the natural ingredients, in some way, have healing properties. But we're unaware of it. We're, we're very concerned with the aesthetics of smell. And um, so I think you're, I, I didn't quite get your question. Is it about w does synthetics do harm? Or w was your question about uh, are we not communicating enough on how synthetics harm the skin? Or? There's a lot of harm which can come you know, to the end user. From, from, from using synthetic... Uh, 
yeah. synthetically or you know man-made oils and things like that which you do use in perfumes as well yeah i mean i have yeah i okay. have so yeah there's there's a long disc i mean that that discussion deserves sort of and there's there's panels of people talking and discussing about that um, um at a global scale about the harm naturals cause with toxicity of certain molecules in the natural and the harm synthetics can cause i mean our palate has been very reduced because of allergens and so on and so forth. And um, um, I'm, I'm just not, I'm not convinced enough about harm synthetic cause and harms natural causes and all of those things. I think we just don't know enough about it. I'm not sure just, you know, being synthetic of being of synthetic origin doesn't mean that it's harmful. Or being natural doesn't mean that it's great either, you know. It's, um, and actually, one thing to bear in mind is that um, a lot of natural products, like, think of sandalwood, um, have a, a use and um, extensive use of some natural products has a terrible ecological impact. Like there's various species of agar wood are now on these endangered species lists. And uh, got to think about things like ambergris as well and coming from sperm whales. So, so you know, if everyone gets really into certain natural, I mean, jasmine's okay, you can farm that, but there's some very important naturals that if we all get into, it's going to have a horrible impact on the environment. I don't think we have enough naturals to feed or fragrance the world. That is a fact. So without synthetics, the world would smell awful. <laughs> okay, so I'll, take, I'll just take the next question. Yeah, so I'm, when I meant sort of abstract there in a more sort of philosophical um, sense. And uh, like I said, uh, you know, in that context, um, smell is the quality of earth um, for kind of like more of the sort of Hindu philosophies. And, uh, and Earth is, has all these other sensory qualities as well. And, but actually, you know, in a way, because smell is the quality of Earth, and Earth is tangible and audible, uh, you know, just think of a sort of big lump of sulfur or something. You, you know, it makes a noise, it, you can feel it, you can see it, you can smell it. And um, so in, actually, in a way, smell is the most concrete of the senses, because where there is a lump of stuff, where there is a smell, there is a lump of stuff. Whereas it's a bit of a contrast with the West, where smell is often seen as sort of ethereal and floaty and sort of gaseous. Whereas it, 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 um, they don't have the notion of an odorous gas, an invisible odorous gas. They don't have that notion. There's all, with smell, there's always particles of a lump of stuff. So it's actually a very concrete sense, in fact. Which, and that brings me to the other question. Um, with uh, the, 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 the sort of Buddhism, Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism. I mean, one thing that I really noticed is the different orders um, in which they list the senses and where smell falls in the senses. So in the Hindu context, uh, you know, smell often gets listed first or last, depending on which way you do the list, because it has the full sort of gamut of um, sense qualities available to it. And the Buddhists listed in the middle of their list of senses when they're, and they do this in all sorts of contexts and actually you get some of the Buddhist list in some of the Ayurvedic texts which kind of is rather interesting and so for them you know like the the the, the, the sort of senses go from near to far so you can see further than you can hear and then you can smell pretty far but no you can't smell the moon and uh, and then like you know you can taste you know in your mouth and you can feel inside your whole body uh, and Jane's list smell according to the number of senses different sentient beings have. So, you know, one sense beings only have touch, and then there's a kind of pyramid of senses above that. So that's one big difference. And, and then one thing I did notice was perhaps the earliest, really early references to sandalwood tend to be making it into a paste, saying something like the Ramayana. Sandalwood is a paste, or it might be on a funeral pyre. But they're not like making boxes out of it and statues and things like that in the really early references. It's a perfume, basically, at that point. And then the earliest references to sandalwood, like statues and artifacts, seem to be in some very early Buddhist texts. Particularly, there's this sandalwood statue of the Buddha, which now you get a lot of sandalwood artifacts. There's probably some for sale just over there. And so you tend to think of sandalwood as a kind of common substance for making things out of. But it seems that the earliest, the no we're talking about text here, I don't know about practice, but certainly the earliest representations of objects made of sandalwood are Buddhist. And say, a sandalwood Buddha, if you think before then, sandalwood was always a paste. Sandalwood Buddha is basically like a, a lipstick Buddha or a kind of Chanel number no. five Buddha. I mean, it was like a perfume statue made of perfume that didn't require any perfume putting on it, if you think about it as well. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think we're time, yep. Yeah. 
That is that. Um, they'll be available. If you want more questions, probably you can ask them after the session. They'll be available for book signing. So thank you so much, James. Thank you, Janvi, for flying down for the session. Thank you. Thank you all three again.